The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. There is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is another theory which states that this has already happened. This is Paul Steinhardt. Okay, I'm uh, Paul Steinhardt, reading from Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, maybe you haven't heard of Paul, but a brief bio of him can almost sound like a character profile out of Hitchhiker's Guide. He's credited with coming up with the concept of quasi-crystals and coining the word itself. Then he led a massive quest to find the first naturally forming quasi-crystal, which he did on Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula, and discovered in the process another new material that was named Steinhardtite after him. He's one of the leading cosmologists of today, but he studied no cosmology until after he earned his PhD. I had been brought up with the idea that cosmology was one of those soft areas of science that theorists shouldn't spend a lot of time thinking about. He helped come up with the inflationary model of the Big Bang, which was really more of a big stretch, as he's quick to clarify. And that would have been an important theoretical accomplishment in and of itself. But then he saw the implications of that theory, he turned against it, and developed a radically different one. I always joke that you're sort of denying paternity for the, <laughs> for the original model. This new theory, developed with Neil Turok, does away with the Big Bang and replaces it with a possibly never-ending series of bounces. The universe then expands and contracts in cycles, like an endlessly inflating and deflating balloon. Oh, and he's the Albert Einstein Professor in Science at Princeton University, which is about the best job title a person can have, right? I'm Patrick Coleman, and this is Into the Impossible. Today, we're looking at what happens at the limits of understanding, both at what theories of the beginning or beginnings of the universe can tell us, and at how those theories complicate our religious frames of reference. We'll do this in two parts. First, through a conversation between Clark Center Associate Director Brian Keating and Paul Steinhardt on the thrill of discovery and how to cultivate imaginative originality in science. And then secondly, via the cosmological and theological musings of science fiction author and futurist David Brin, who gave a talk as part of our Time, Mathematics, and the Mind of God event last summer. If they continue like this, nothing will be beyond them. Therefore, let us confuse and scatter them. Because we're the Clark Center, and because this is where Paul's book Endless Universe begins, we need to start in one particular place. Two boys sit in darkened cinemas, one in London and one in Miami, set to watch Stanley Kubrick's movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. It is 1968, a year of worldwide conflict and turmoil. Vietnam, the arms race, political assassinations, student protests, and rebellions. But all this is forgotten as the film sweeps the boys along in a glorious tale of science, space, and the future. The boy in Miami witnessed firsthand the awesome power of technology to annihilate or inspire. Six years earlier, from his home near Homestead Air Force Base, he watched missiles being prepared for a strike on Cuba, knowing that his family and community would be obliterated if the looming crisis led to a nuclear exchange. Then, as the crisis subsided, he became galvanized by John F. Kennedy's promise to send a man to the moon by the end of the decade. He emerged from these early experiences optimistic about the power of technology to improve the future and fascinated by all things scientific. He kept logbooks of every manned mission and traveled often to Cape Canaveral to observe the launches. He turned the family garage into a laboratory with large stocks of chemicals and biological specimens. And he headed to the Everglades at night avoiding the city lights and fending off mosquitoes to take a peek at the heavens through his telescope.
The final moments of the film, in which David Bowman makes contact with the mysterious monolith, would foreshadow or help nudge into existence the imaginative scope of Paul's theoretical work in adulthood. He was moving through a new order of creation of which few men ever dreamed. Beyond the realms of sea and land and air and space lay the realms of fire, which he alone had been privileged to glimpse. It was much too much to expect that he would also understand. I, I love the, the way that you describe the power of the, the cinema, the film. And that's Brian Keating, who, in addition to helping steer the Clark Center, is a cosmologist himself. Uh, and in particular, our namesake's film, uh, based on by Senna's book, as a time machine, as a teleportation device, uh, the creativity, the imagination that it uh, really inspired. You know, who knows if that you know caused you to be the creative scientist that you are today. But uh, let's I go think, to the conversation know, between uh, the two of them, starting with what attracted Paul to it's tackle the problems of cosmology. And uh, what transformed me was. Uh, in 1980, spring 1980, I went to a high-energy physics seminar. My field was high-energy physics. I was working on abstract qu problems in quantum field theory. Uh, and uh, I went to our weekly seminar, and there was a young fellow there by the name of Alan Guth, who was a uh, postdoc at the time at Stanford and uh, gave a talk on uh, what he called the inflationary universe. And I had no preparation for this talk. It was just a, at the weekly seminar. But I was completely floored by this, this talk. It was uh, uh, in some ways the most exciting and most depressing talk I ever went to. <laughs> uh, it was exciting because he began by um, – fr from first principles, just explaining to someone who – like me who knew nothing about cosmology what the basic – understanding of Big Bang cosmology was, the, Friedman, the famous Friedman equations that, we, that describe simple Big Bang. Um, and then he began to describe the problems with the standard Big Bang model. There are certain properties that we observe about the universe that seem unlikely and, uh, to occur coming out of a Big Bang, why it should be so smooth on large scales, why it shouldn't be curved, why it shouldn't be warped. And then he had this great idea for how to resolve this problem, which he called inflation, which, 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 which was to arrange a situation in which the uh, universe would undergo a per brief period of well, – I should say a period of accelerated expansion, much faster expansion than you would have ever expected in the Big Bang model, uh, doubling in size every trillionth, trillionth, trillionth of a second or so. And um, – and this would help smooth and flatten the universe out and you know, so do, solve the problems you were trying to solve. Uh, the physics behind it involved features of quantum field theory, which were right in my backyard, things I was familiar with, but I never thought about them having any application on the scale of the universe. I was interested in their application to um, the particle world, the micro world. But suddenly it had this application. So that was the exciting part. And then the last few minutes of the talk, he explained how this idea s fails, that once this inflation starts by this mechanism that he proposed, it would never stop. And you'd never end up a universe which has matter in it as we know it. You'd never end up with a universe that has galaxies and stars. So you managed to make everything flat and smooth, but after that it was a dead end. And he, and, and he thought he virtually had a proof at the time that it had to be a dead end. And at the end of that talk, I remember just sitting in my seat and not moving for a while. I thought, wow, this is uh, – this is uh, – this is – too awful. <laughs> this is too beautiful an idea and too awful to imagine that it's suddenly defeated by this. And I thought I would spend uh, a little bit of time, maybe a few weeks, trying to see if I could think of ways around it. Uh, the essential idea that he was working on was the idea that the universe went under a phase transition. And I had a strong background, independent background in condensed matter physics, so I knew a lot about phase transitions. And I thought, well, I can surely, surely there's more phase transitions than the sort, sort he's thinking of. I can uh, I can surely come up with some idea. So I thought it was going to be a few weeks um, uh, digression, uh, which is a digression that continues to this day, but that's, that's how it got started. Interesting. After helping develop this new inflation model for years, doubts started to creep in. Different additions were required to make the theory match with what scientists were observing in the universe. 
These doubts led him to question some of the fundamental assumptions about the Big Bang theory, including whether there was a Big Bang at all. You know, the recurring theme throughout this book is, you know, for lack of a better word, word it is really, is there a creation? And, you know, was there a single creation? Were there multiple creations? Um, and uh, as you, uh, you know, being a scholar, know uh, these theories are as old as, you know, I always say that the models which have a universe that is not uh, originating in a single event like the Big Bang – you know, I've had more, you know, reinventions than Cher and Madonna and, you know, <laughs> more, more reinvigorations than, than those two, uh, those two folks and others. But, um, but your, your model is a little bit different than either the static universe that uh, my colleague, my late colleague, Jeff Burbage subscribed to and Hoyle as well. Um, you, you have a different take on the very origin of the universe and, and I think um, it would be interesting to hear it in your own words how, uh, how you think the universe uh, had a beginning, did it not have a beginning, um, how, does your, how does your theory agree with or disagree with uh, the data that we have today. Uh, I think it will be interesting for our listeners to hear. Okay. Um, well, I should say that just to, just, to, just to connect it to what we discussed earlier that um, – uh, this idea didn't grow out, uh, didn't, di- didn't emerge whole. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was um, an idea that's, uh, that in, uh, sort of ran into uh, at first by just exploring lots of possibilities and then discovering that uh, the more we explored it, um, in some sense, the easier it became which is, for a theorist, one of the ways you can sense, you get a sense that you're heading in a positive direction. So leading up to, the, you know, so for, you know, we talked about the origins of inflationary idea, how I got involved in that. Um, uh, pretty soon, if, within a few years after the inflationary theory was, well, actually, the very first time we, uh, we the very first example we wrote down of an inflationary model, there were, I already had a concern about it, hmm. which is that in order to get that model to work, you had to tune certain parameters, certain features of it in a, in a special way in order to make it work. Mm-hmm. And I hoped to get rid of that feature, but it, uh, but it didn't occur in the early years. And then as we discovered – as we explored the model further, uh, we discovered that when you take proper account of the role of quantum physics in it, the model didn't work as we had thought. We had thought that it was basically a model about an, a rapidly expanding universe, a universe in which general relativity, the rules of general relativity, which describe rapid expansion, would be the dominant feature. And that if there was any quantum physics involved, it would be in a minor way, producing minor variations in the distribution of matter and energy. But we were wrong about that. It turns out it's completely inverse. Quantum physics rules the day. <laughs> and, and quantum physics... Uh, amplified by general relativity causes the inflationary universe never really to end everywhere as we'd hoped but to continue eternally and to create more and more regions with more and more different properties over time eternally. Hmm. What we call – well, people call it a multiverse but uh, uh, – my collaborator, I like, nowadays like to call it a multi-mess because mm-hmm. it's, it basically turns a universe which was supposed to be simple and orderly into a mess, uh, destroying all the predictive power of the theory. Now, I didn't have that idea in mind when we began working on this alternative idea. It was merely at that time I hadn't you know, fully appreciated just what a mess it created. Mm-hmm. But I was just interested in the question, is there any alternative to the idea of inflation that competes with it? I'm not an experimentalist. I can't do what you do, Brian, go out and do an experiment to test a theory. So what I can do as a theorist is I can ask, can I find a theory that does as well and maybe better? And I had been doing that kind of exploration for a while. And where um, where these ideas began was simply saying, well, suppose we replace the Big Bang with a bounce. And by a bounce, we mean a universe – that underwent a period of contraction and a bounced into a period of expansion. Without giving any details, let's just suppose we do that. How does that change the overall cosmic story? And, um, and it was one of those explorations that I thought, you know, maybe in a month or so we would show that it's fundamentally flawed. It would lead to something inconsistent with what we observed. But what we found instead is that 
the more we pushed it, and that continues to this day, the simpler it gets. Every time a challenge comes up, you know, you might say, oh, what about this? You didn't think about this. Well, that's the kind of thing that scares you as a theorist. Not thinking about this can sometimes mean, oh, I have to add something new to my theory to protect myself from this, or I have to complicate it in some way. We found in the process of developing this idea, and up to the present time even, is that Every time we thought we were challenged, we might be stuck for a while, but when we finally found the solution, it actually made things simpler, not, hmm. not more complicated. And well, that's a good sign. It doesn't prove anything, but it's a really good sign when you get that feeling uh, for a theory. So um, let's go back. Let me just go back and briefly say, suppose you assume the universe did begin with a bang. What does that – what does the, what, what does that – force you to do. Well, a bang is supposed to be some sudden quantum-dominated event. So it's going to produce a universe which is highly random, highly turbulent, highly curved, highly warped. You've got to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. And you've got to fix that problem fast mm -hmm. because by a second after that bang, the universe is already supposed to be smooth and simple and homogeneous. Uh, so it's got to be something fast and it's got to occur when the temperature and density are very large and that's what led to inflation that you could create a period of hyper, uh, uh, very high energies could produce a period of very rapid expansion. But that also has a cost. That, that high energy also leads to strong gravitational back reaction effect which leads to large quantum fluctuations which you didn't want which produce eternal inflation and this multi-mess. Mm -hmm. So beginning with the idea that the universe had a beginning and that you had a short time to solve it, you were forced to inflation, but then that led to a problem, mm -hmm. which is the multi-mess and non-predictability. So you say, okay, well, I have to change. How can I fix this problem? Uh, and you say, well, okay, let me go back to my, what did I assume? What did I go wrong? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, suppose that wasn't the beginning. Suppose actually time existed before the bang. Now suddenly you don't have a time constraint in order to get to, to work out the structure of the universe. In fact, you have an unlimited amount of time. Mm -hmm. You don't have to come up with an explanation for what caused the bang because there's not a bang anymore. There's simply a, a bounce, which is something more prosaic in a certain sense. Um, then you say, but I invented this. How do I get the smoothing that it was supposed to get? Well, it turns out a slowly contracting universe automatically smooths and flattens without doing anything at all. Just, I mean, it's just something we hadn't realized because we were so fixed on the idea of a universe expanding because that's what we observe today that people never spent time thinking about what happens during a contracting phase of the universe. And it turns out during a contracting phase, the problems that plagued you in a rapidly, ex in, a, in a big bang expanding universe that it tended, it was unlikely to be flat and unlikely to be smooth, the opposite occurs in a contracting universe. It tends towards being smooth and flat. So already, not only do you have more time to solve a problem, but you have, without doing anything at all, just you know, saying you're contracting, you immediately begin to address some of the problems you wanted to solve. Then you say, okay, but I need to somehow make these small fluctuations. You don't want a perfectly smooth universe because then you wouldn't have the fluctuations you need in the distribution of matter and energy, the variations, that would eventually seed the formation of galaxies or produce the fluctuations in temperature that you and your colleagues, experimental colleagues, observe in the cosmic microwave background. How is that going to happen? Well, inflation it was herp happening by quantum fluctuations. It's just that you had amplification of ones you didn't want. In the by amplification, I mean uh, inflation. They, regions that you didn't want would become huge in volume and, that's, and, and then come to dominate the universe and they wouldn't have the properties that you wanted. What would happen in a contracting universe? Well, you'd still have quantum fluctuations. Nothing stops quantum physics. Now they'd be quantum fluctuations, though, in the rate of contraction. Mm -hmm. So rare quantum flu rare fluctuations, instead of inflating and becoming large regions of space, are now contracting regions, which become small, insignificant regions of space. So suddenly you don't have this multi-mess problem mm -hmm. at all. You just get a, you find that what you would typically expect is actually will be the typical outcome. Uh, you don't have to worry about rare events being taking Dominant. over the universe. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, we haven't done anything at all. We haven't written down a single equation yet, but just by these few words we've just said, we've just addressed some of the most fundamental problems in cosmology just by replacing the bang with a bounce. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you have to put pencil to paper and begin to write equations and see if you can make something sensible. But that's the kind of aha moment that you know, sort of tells you that, ah, this is going to be easier than I thought, not harder than <laughs> I thought. 
Um, and then you can begin to address other questions about you know space and time. Because space and time exist forever. Uh, we've been – ever since the uh, 1960s when uh, the first observation of the cosmic microwave background was made, uh, people were convinced that the universe had to have a beginning. Uh, it really wasn't a proof of that. It was really based on a line of inference. Uh, there's nothing that proves – the microwave background doesn't require the universe have a – space and time have a beginning. It was just the leading picture at the time. Um, and um, now you can ask the question, is it possible – now once I have a bounce, can I avoid ever having a beginning? Have what we, what we mathematically call a geodesically complete universe, a universe that would exist forever? And the answer turns out to be yes. So that's, that's rather interesting. So we can either have a universe which has a beginning – or we can have one which doesn't have a beginning but has a bounce replacing a bang. So those are kind of the beginnings of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, then another important influence was the discovery of – for me was the discovery of dark energy. Uh, the idea that the universe is accelerating today, um, which most astronomers at the moment attribute – assume is due to the fact that there's a cosmological constant, a never-changing, never-reducible vacuum energy that dominates the universe. But um, – and therefore, they think of it as kind of separate from the issues of the early universe. But that – I don't think that idea makes any sense to me. I mean this is a profound discovery that says the structure and evolution of the universe is undergoing a radical change. We're in the process of change right now going forward and it's got to be connected to – the beginning of the universe. Right. But how can you connect something in the late universe which has to do with – you know, it takes time to get to this point where you have this dilution of matter and energy to observe this dark energy. How could that ever really be related in a direct way to the beginning of the universe when the energy and density was so much higher? How, how, does, how does the end know anything about the beginning? Well, maybe because – they actually are connected in the sense that maybe the evolution of the universe is cyclic mm -hmm. and that the experience we're having now, the acceleration, is not just the end point of some beginning but actually is setting us for a new beginning, a next cycle of evolution. Could the dark energy be part of this whole story of bouncing and sort of preparing us for the next bounce? And that led to the idea of a cyclic universe mm -hmm. which was an ancient idea mm -hmm. uh, but has a completely modern – Refiguring uh, in this in, in the picture that uh, like share. that we're doing, which involves uh, uh, dark energy and and, uh, and and a contraction and a bounce, um, and as crazy as that idea, you know, that imaginative or imaginative or, or as you might think that ideas are fantastical, as you may think that idea is, when you begin to, again to work out the equations and say, well, how difficult would this be to arrange? It seems to be surprisingly not difficult <laughs> or surprisingly <laughs> easy. So that's, again, a, a, an intriguing hint that you know, maybe this idea is also important and that dark energy is intimately connected to the forces that actually drive the bounce and at least interesting predictions about the future of the universe, where we're headed, mm -hmm. which are different from the conventional story. This is what's really interesting to me. What does it take, mentally, creatively, and personally, not just to create a profound new theory about the birth of the universe, but then to kick it to one side and create a radically different one? There's a lot of intellectual and imaginative dexterity there, but other forces are also at play, driving that urge to discover. Brian and Paul started to talk about this drive by way of Galileo, the prototypical modern scientist. I remember reading about, uh, we had Mario Biagioli, who's a scholar on Galileo from, um, from Italy and Harvard. And, and he's, he's discussed, you know, when Galileo did open up this window, uh, we view Galileo as this hero, you know, heroic figure of science fighting against these tyrannical forces of the Vatican and, mm -hmm. and science triumphing eventually, but not, not certainly for Galileo. I think it was the telescope probably pr proved disastrous for him in some ways personally. But when he made these discoveries, Mario uh, discusses in his book, uh, Galileo's Instruments of Credit, uh, he discusses how um, Galileo kept these, kept these ob observations relatively secret for a while. Yes. And I think part of it was 
he was scared. I mean, a lot of people think of scientists as Isaac Asimov, you, you quote in the book as well, um, you know, saying the most interesting thing a scientist says is not Eureka, which is Greek for I found it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, you know, that's weird or that's odd. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people have this sort of distorted notion that we scientists are just, you know, stroking our beards, you know, in our cases, not, non-existent beards. But, uh, but, but that's not really the way science is, is done. And I think uh, even more so than that's that's odd. It's it's that's scary or that's str like. Have you ever experienced that you know creative moment in your mo many careers? Uh, you know within theoretical physics, you know where you felt a little bit of fear or or just that you were seeing something or thinking of something for the very first time, perhaps in human history. What is that experience like? Because because you've well, had that happen to you a few times. Yeah, to me that's the most exciting thing. That's mm -hmm. that's that's the whole reason why I've always wanted to do science. So uh, uh, when I was a kid, my uh, a kid I mean like a, a toddler where you'd be sitting on your father's knee and uh, being told stories. And uh, my father, you know, would sometimes tell me fairy tale stories, but he would also tell me science stories. I, I have no idea why. He was not a scientist. He, he was a lawyer. <laughs> but I guess he liked science somehow and, or, and, and somehow was reading about science. So, I mean, you would tell me science stories, and the science story would always involve some exciting moment of discovery. You know, Madame Curie discovering radium that's glowing in, in, the, in the laboratory. And, um, and I just remember thinking, wow, I mean, to, dis to be the first person ever to discover something, the first person on the planet. We're, we're just human biological beings on a planet, but still it's a remarkable thing to have that moment of discovery. So I thought, yeah, that's what I – that's exactly the feeling I want to have. And and so that's what I keep seeking in in all the science I work on to try to find problems. I, I try to when I choose something I work on, I like to choose a problem where I, I have to imagine that if I manage to solve this problem, I'm going to be really excited by the answer. Mm -hmm. If I'm not excited about it, I should go work on something else. Mm -hmm. And um, and and then you know most of the time you fail, <laughs> but every now and then you mm -hmm. succeed. And then that's worth, you know, that, that's worth all the, uh, all the whole thing. That's a nice way to put it. And, you know, I, I tell people and I describe you that you're uh, addicted to discovery. You know, you have, a, <laughs> you have a healthy addiction. They also discussed to what extent big prizes like the Nobel serve to motivate great original science. To me, though, the whole privilege and joy of doing science is the moment of personal discovery. You know, those brief moments when you know you're the only person ever up to this point that knows a cer something to be true mm -hmm. or likely to be true. And, uh, and it's a brief period of time because eventually you do tell somebody, but I always, I always wait a little bit, you know, before I do that because I just like to enjoy that experience. <laughs> uh, so it's at least going to be a day or two. I don't re immediately run to someone's Savoring office it, right? and, and say, uh, well, Eureka, as you, as you put it, <laughs> or something like that. Um, and uh, so to me, the, you know, from my personal experience, uh, the Nobel Prize and other prizes are have been more, at least in my scientific experience, more negative contributions to science than positive, in the sense that there are too many people who who spend their energy, their their emotional energy, and their uh, even their scientific energy uh, trying to win this prize or that prize, and. Uh, and some of my worst experiences in interacting with people, the worst behaviors, you know, the worst human behaviors of jealousy and fighting and, and non-open-mindedness are all, you know, I find they can be traced back to people who have those kinds of ambitions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we're, if we're up to me, mm -hmm. I'd be very happy to eliminate those or reduce them to a level that, you know, it, it's, it's nice to be able to pat someone on the back mm -hmm. and say, wow, that's, you know, you really did something really impressive. You know, Vera Rubin did something wonderful and impressive, no matter what prize she got. And mm -hmm. that's permanent. That's forever. Mm -hmm. And um, the prize is kind of, uh, in, in some ways, it's almost um, demeaning to the experience. The, mm -hmm. the experience of discovery is, is, is much more profound than any th prize or accolation that I think humans can give it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of the way I view it. Since awards and external accolades aren't, or shouldn't be at least, the things we hinge our hopes on, there have to be other and better ways to cultivate and encourage imagination in the sciences. Do you feel there's any 
not magic bullet, but do you think there's any recipe perhaps to increase the successful potential of scientists to become creative, not just be calculators and computers themselves? Yeah, I think I think well, I think you, I think first of all, you, there's two two things that come to mind when you ask the question. One is uh, for young children, um, and in school education, which tends to teach method over creativity. Um, I think the more that you can, um, I think one way of bringing creativity in at that level is is not to give students an answer, but uh, encourage them to find many ways to get any given answer to a question. Find you know whatever you, whatever you're teaching. Let's say math is the simplest example. There are many. We know there's many routes to solving a problem, and uh, okay, teachers trying to teach the. Pop, uh, uh, trying try, try to get through their task of, right. uh, of getting their students State to pass their exams right. <clears throat> will try to focus in on this is the method to be used mm-hmm. rather than let's, um, let's see how many methods you can invent mm. that will get you to that answer. And let's discover which ones work and which ones don't work mm-hmm. and which ones are efficient and which ones aren't efficient. And I think this kind of, and the same for science and the mm-hmm. same, you know, mm-hmm. what, what are efficient routes of learning and what are inefficient routes of learning. I think the more you could bring that into education, I think it would that would be a big there help. And, and I think that um, today, in, uh, at least in, in the fields that I work in, I think there's another kind of challenge, which is there's a lot of uh, social network uh, inhibition of creativity coming from fellow scientists mm-hmm. trying, to impose, like mm-hmm. trying to impose their views, on, especially on younger scientists, mm-hmm. and to try to herd them into um, the dog get room. them to flock mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, I, I, it's not so much the ideas that they're trying to get them to flock to, but the idea of they're getting them to flock at all that's right. bothering me. Their ideas may be valid, but mm-hmm. they're pr- probably in science. We know there's going to be many different interesting ideas to pursue, and you should right. be encouraging people to to spread out in what they're trying to pursue. And I felt like when I was a graduate student, for example, there was a strong reward for doing something original. Mm -hmm. And I feel like today there's a strong punishment for trying to do something original. Mm -hmm. Uh, You get, you know, if, if, because when you try to do something original, Mm -hmm. you often try to, you're off, it's often not going to come out right the first time. And this is an example of that. We're talking about the bouncing universe. Mm -hmm. It didn't come out, you know, whole, you know, whole, you know, it was, we ran into things and then we solved them and we found the solution was simpler and we discovered things along the way. Uh, I feel like uh, this process of discovery uh, gets strongly bashed by the social network, which is, which is now much more public and visible than it was in the past due yeah. to the internet. And it makes it really hard for young people to come up with original ideas. Yeah. So, so if you come up with original idea in the past and it wasn't quite right, what would have happened? You might have had a conversation with a few people. You might have given a seminar. A few people in the seminar might have raised their hands. Oh, I think there's a problem there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you would have had a chance to go back and either fix it or, or drop it. Abandon it. Uh, nowadays, the chances are that that little, conver- that little seminar is, is, it was videotaped. Yep. And probably there was someone twittering and mm-hmm. blogging while you were talking and, and criticizing you. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there's a tremendous social punishment. Mm-hmm. And the result of that is that uh, you find that people are flocking around very few ideas. Mm-hmm. And instead of challenging the ideas, which are clearly flawed, mm-hmm. I mean, it's clear that our leading <laughs> ideas, whether it's cosmological or high energy physics, they're clearly incomplete at best, but probably flawed because mm-hmm. they're not working out the way we thought they would work out. Uh, they need challenges. Right. But who's going to be the challengers? Right. The challengers are constantly getting squashed. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I think that's a... a, a that's something that I think the scientific community had better work on mm-hmm. quickly because yeah. I think we're just not going to draw the talent. Yeah. Well, if you're talented and you want to have, be able to express your creativity, mm-hmm. I don't think doing theoretical physics is necessarily the best way to do it mm-hmm. because, because of this bashing. That's right. You know, maybe I'll start a company. Maybe I'll work on software. Maybe I'll work, you know. I'll go work on some other area right. of science. I'm not a politician. This. Why am I getting yeah, yeah. all this? Yeah, why, right? am I, mm-hmm. why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. So, now, that, not, that used to not be the case. Right. It used to be this was yeah. the place to go the description to express your creativity. Of Guth. So I think it's a really serious problem. 
Yeah, I always th- think when I, <clears throat> you know, when I decide to you know, spend uh, some of my time and money, you know, to read a book like this, uh, yeah, I think of the the greatest story ever ever told and sold as as, as the Bible, right? That's the mm-hmm. best-selling book in in history. And if you think about it, you know, I mean, it's really what we get the Ten Commandments from, and, and a lot of, uh, of and people think of it as a book of of laws, you know, perhaps for for Jewish people, Christian people, um, etc. But uh, but the book begins with the story of creation. So for a book about you know if you go to your local law school, we don't have one here in San Diego, UC San Diego, but we're in Princeton, to, yeah, <laughs> right. <coughs> That's why we're so successful. Just right. kidding to the lawyers <laughs> out there. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, you know, people seem to be you know you wouldn't find in your law you know intro to law you wouldn't find a story of the creation of the earth or something. So it's always been you know humorous that or amusing that you see. This book, which is about laws, and you know most of it is about that, but it begins with the story of of the origin of the universe, and mm-hmm. uh, according to this to this uh, this conception, and what's interesting to me is you know both uh, people in, in, in Judaism, uh, you know rabbis, theologians, the the Talmud, the second most important book to, to Jewish thinkers, um, says very clearly that you're um, it's 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 permissible to look back and try to figure out everything that's happened since the creation of the universe, but it says explicitly uh, about that which happened before there was time, you may not ask. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's interesting is, is uh, in all the steady state models, and, and there, are, there are Christian theologians, Hugh Ross, who's at uh, the Discovery Institute, a famous Christian seminary um, and thinker, uh, has basically said, you know, if we could disprove uh, the Big Bang in some sense or prove that there wasn't a singular event, then that's equivalent to – Basically, showing that the biblical description is wrong, and that would be essentially, in his opinion, this uh, Ross's opinion, the only way to falsify uh, this. And, and, and he's a Caltech trained, uh, actually. I think he's a geophysicist or astrophysicist. Um, but nevertheless, I think these are really interesting questions. You know, they really tie into these. Uh, you know, it must be humanity's deepest urge. If this is one of the greatest, the greatest book ever, you know, sold in, in history, it must be appealing to people in some in some way. And what I love about your writing is you tell stories. Um, and and, and you, you think about you know, things which on the surface might seem impossible. It would be hard to talk about the creation of the universe or its cycles of rebirth without bringing religion to mind. As Brian points out, science and religion are often positioned as being at war with one another. But David Brin, the author of The Postman and numerous other works of science fiction and futurist speculation, and himself, a UCSD-trained astrophysicist to boot, has a different point of view, one that celebrates the mutual curiosity of those with scientific and religious beliefs and values. In a conversation that begins, like the Abrahamic creation in Genesis. First off, who can tell me what was the moment of purity in the relationship between God and his creations, us? In the Bible, the only really pure moment that had absolutely nothing to do with sin, not telling you not to, not punishing after, or dealing with the, with the effects of a fallen creature, it was collegial. It was a moment between a master and apprentice. And it's the only pure moment Now, if you haven't read Genesis or you're not familiar, then you're a modern scientifically inclined, science fictionally inclined, or agnostically or atheistically inclined modern person. I'm not going to hold it against you, except that I will because this is one of the cultural capstones and you're going to be needing this to talk to some of your neighbors, to talk them down from some of their current fear that all of this is going away. It's not all going away, but it's going to have to be recouched. And that moment in the Bible is when God asks Adam to name all the beasts. It's utterly collegial, completely friendly, free of all threats or demands or sin or anything. And what is naming? Naming is exactly what God did a page earlier in order to create the entire universe. And here he's asking obviously an apprentice, to engage in a very mild version. Well, what is science? 
but naming new beasts, sending out space probes to name new planets and stars. Is it any accident that we do it so well? A few years ago, we sent an aero shell through the wispy Martian atmosphere. If we had missed by a hundredth of a degree in any direction, it would have been lost. The aero shell pops out, out pops a, a, a parachute that then leads to another parachute, then three parachutes, and it heads toward a tiny, tiny needle point of a piece speck of land, and then off go the parachutes and rockets go off. And this thing then hovers and lowers by crane a robot that has been working ever since on our behalf. And you think that anything like that could be done simply on human competence? It may, either we are really good, and that is actually my theory, or there might be something sacred about it. Now, am I engaging in this theological ledger or domain in order to convince you that the story of the Bible is accurate? No, but it makes great conversation. And it's thought-provoking, and that's what you're here for. And we give you your money's worth. <laughs> the most important happens a few days, a few pages later, the Tower of Babel. Now, in the Book of Mormon and in the Quran, God is really pissed off that we're building this tower, but not in the source material. Look it up. There is not one lick of anger, not even a clue of anger, pardon me, no anger at all. A page earlier, he drowns everybody. A page later, he's pouring fire on cities. Here he says, if they continue like this, nothing will be beyond them. Therefore, let us confuse and scatter them. Now that's calm. But it's also very interesting that for thousands of years, people who discussed this interpreted it as anger and ignored the entire second half of that first sentence. If they continue like this, nothing will be beyond them. In Genesis, they have eaten from the tree of life, of knowledge. If they are allowed to, they will eat from the tree of life and live forever. In other words, implicit is the capability to be gods. Now, that is makes it pretty clear why previous theologians <laughs> never, did, never took those interpretations. Because it is an arrogant and hubristic and very adolescent interpretation to say, hey, Dad, we're becoming just like you. But as is hinted by the, Einstein's famous quote about incomprehensibility and comprehensibility of the cosmos, it is as if the workshop of creation was left unlocked with the lights on and the reagents all bubbling. And that's what we've been doing and we're rebuilding that tower now. And no language is going to stand in the way. The promise of the Tower of Babel is communication. And not just communication, but understanding. Science and religion still seem to have a ways to go in understanding each other. And it isn't just that people of religious faith could stand to read more peer-reviewed science journals. I think that it's very important that modernist people know enough religion and theology to be able to talk to our neighbors. Because many of them are scared. And the way to solve the war on science is not just by defeating them at the ballot box, it's also by reaching out to them. And I have found that when I talk theology with people of the extreme fundamentalist 
frame of mind. I find that I don't get rage. Even when I poke, I get friendliness because I bothered. Because I bothered to speak to them in terms that they understood that they had some expertise. And even when I would point out that the, led, that the, that the lessons of Genesis are different, that the book of Jonah utterly defeats the horrible, loathsome book of Revelation. Utterly. Utterly. And you can ask about that in questions. I get no hostility. Because they're curious. But I bothered to talk to them in terms that weren't patronizing. Here, though, David suggests a fundamental and I think very important difference in orientation. Look, every civilization, almost every human civilization, tribe, nation, believed that there was a golden age in the past when people were better, when they flew through the skies, they were close to God. And they fell from this state of grace because of some mistaken error. The grass was greener when in grandpa's day, except ours. We believe that if there is a golden age, it is one that we will build, or more likely, that we will build people qualified to build the builders of a golden age. But to be people who are capable of building the builders of the builders of miracles, that's pretty That's good. That's pretty good. Still, there can be a diversity of ways of taking part in that vision. Some purely scientific, some purely religious, and most in that wibbledy wobbledy in between. We are different, and we're trying something new. And not everyone can do it. And what Andy does is he sets aside the need that many feel for a re personal relationship with the universe. And one special aspect to it is the need and efficacy of prayer. Now, as scientists, we know that prayer does not affect the physical universe, but it has one very reliable effect. Cause and effect, product, useful. And that's called strength. You know it's true. You know it's true that people, many people, have prayed and gotten strength. It's totally subjective, but it is verifiable and repeatable. And we dismiss this too casually. Yes, 99.999%, it's likely the fact that we're descended from people who got strength that way. But to dismiss that felt need by many, many people, I think is a mistake. In this way, a cyclic view of the universe and how that felt need interacts with cosmology comes together via a wonderful, if questionable, theory. Now, Frank Tipler, he took this look forward notion in an incredible book called The Physics of Immortality. You were wondering when I was going to weave physics back in, and time. And he was in the running with Freeman Dyson to be, in my opinion, theologian of the 20th century. Why? Because Tipler took the notion that was then thought possible that the universe would be slowed down from the Big Bang by gravity. And eventually, maybe 100 billion years from now, come to a stop, turn around, and fall back in. And that would have been a very convenient version of the cyclic universe. That it bounces, goes out, bounces, lose, refreshes its energy clock, uh, entropy clock, bounces out, and so on. And his book was both infuriating and brilliant, and that the notion was that God does not exist at this moment of time, but he will. When the universe is collapsing back together again, 
Suddenly, the speed of light won't be a limit to conversation, and all of the different civilizations will be in communication with each other, sharing all the wisdom they've acquired over the course of two, three hundred billion years. And God will happen then. And the second thing is, when they're all coming back together, the heat that's formed will provide so much energy that if all the matter in the universe is turned into computronium, then during that last million years before the final crunch, they will be able to simulate all things in all variations, infinitely. Now here's the final cool thing. Have any of you ever stood outside on a clear night when you could see the stars, maybe lied on the grass and stared at the stars? You thought you were just fooling around, weren't you? And sometimes that leads to fooling around. <laughs> no, you were emitting infrared into space. In other words, when they all come together at the end, they collect all that infrared and they see you lying on a blanket under the stars. And they say, okay, that's another ancestor. That's another ancestor. And they resurrect you all. And so the notion that Tipler raised in the physics of immortality is that at the omega point, I am the alpha and the omega, the last letter in the Greek alphabet, that at the omega point, at the end of the universe, the last million years, all are resurrected in computronium, that all are brought back and given a heaven or a re-simulation. As was said by a famous character in the movie, The Cowboys, if it ain't true, it ought to be. <laughs> but it's not. The tide may have turned against Tipler's theory, but it's a provocative theory nonetheless, one that exhibits bold speculation in the pursuit of original insights into the nature of things and the place of humanity within that order. The jury is still out on Paul Steinhardt and Neil Turok's cyclic model of the universe. In the meantime, we can contemplate it and enjoy it and be inspired by the possibilities it suggests and the originality it might inspire in our own thinking, right at the limit of our present understanding. And we can envy our descendants, whose understanding we hope will extend well beyond what we can presently imagine. Thank you for listening. This has been Into the Impossible, a podcast of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. We'd like to thank our guests, Paul Steinhardt, whose book with Neil Turok is called Endless Universe, Beyond the Big Bang, and David Brin, who most recently edited, along with Stephen Potts, a book called Chasing Shadows, Visions of Our Coming Transparent World. Deep thanks are due also to the Clark Center's patrons and sponsors, including Viasat Inc., members of the Founders Orbit, and the James B. Axe Family Foundation. To find out more about the Clark Center and other exciting projects, research, and programs, please visit imagination.ucsd.edu. Audio production is by Wes Hawkins and Patrick Coleman, produced by Patrick Coleman and Sheldon Brown. And thanks to everyone who's been listening and sharing the podcast and reviewing it on iTunes. If you haven't had a chance, please do so. We really, really appreciate it. We appreciate you listening. And we look forward to sharing the next episode with you next month. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.